Um, so let me just introduce Emily and, uh, and and then I'll maybe pose a question and we can take it from there if that sounds sounds okay. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. So I am um, super incredibly excited that Emily Scott is with us this morning. I have been a huge fan of Emily's for I was calculating it like a decade um, because yeah, <laughs> I know it's like, have you been That's talking? So I thought back, so I thought back, um, so I, inter I interviewed Emily for, and you I'm probably don't even remember this, I interviewed you for Click to Save, which was my oh, I totally book. remember that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like probably 2011 we talked mm -hmm. um, about what you were doing at St. Lydia's from a digital perspective, you know, how are you using your digital, that's kind of how we, so um, since I became aware of your ministry around that period of time, I've just been a huge fan and, and follower and um, have adapted and adopted some of the, the dinner church uh, practices for the, the two congregations I've served um, during that time. So I'm really excited. Thank you for, for being here. So let me just do a little introduction. Emily um, is a church planter and she's the author of this beautiful new book for all who hunger, searching for communion in a shattered world. Um, which got released during the pandemic. So she's been doing a lot of online book <laughs> events as opposed to in-person book events. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I read it in like a day and a half, Emily. I just loved it. Thank you. Thank you for writing it. Um, so Emily is a ELCA pastor and she believes that Christian practice holds out rich possibilities that call us to reach out across boundaries and love, learn through discomfort and build relationships that bring God's, God's realm close. Um, queer and queer gender, she is committed to building communities of faith that dismantle fear and hate, affirm LGBTQ plus people, and confront racial injustice. Um, and her book has been beautifully reviewed. Um, it's from Penguin Random House, and it received starred reviews on Kirkus, Booklist, and Publishers Weekly, much, much deserved. Um, Emily is the, currently serves as the founding pastor of Dreams and Vision, which is an imaginative spiritual community of restoration rooted in the LGBTQ community, uh, and that's in Baltimore. And she's called to this work by the Delaware, Maryland Synod. Um, so, and prior to that, from 2008 to 2017, Emily served as the founding pastor of St. Lydia's Dinner Church in Brooklyn, uh, where worship is a full meal shared around a dinner table. Um, and Emily and the congregation were involved in combat, combating police brutality and advocating for affordable housing with organizations such as Faith New York. Um, St. Lydia sparked a wider dinner church movement and is now a national model for new church starts. Um, so welcome and all around incredible person. <laughs> thanks, <Mr. laughs> Keith, thanks for the invitation. And I have also followed your work, looked up to you and um, yeah, just been very, um, very glad to have you as a colleague through the years. So, and also as an author, it's like wonderful to have other pastors who are authors out there that I can sort of feel like they did it. Yeah. <laughs> and hi to everybody. I wish I could see your faces, but I see your names. So that's good. Hello. Yeah, there, there are 30 <laughs> of us here. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. So uh, probably um, this is on my, this is on my book group list at some point, but I'm sure most people haven't had a chance to, to read this yet. Although if you've been at church, you've experienced some probably dinner church type experiences. We've adapted it for confirmation class when we're teaching about um, communion. Uh, we've used it for Lenten gatherings where we do worship and a meal together. Um, we've used it for vacation Bible school where we do an intergenerational meal and reflection time. So um, thanks for letting us steal all your stuff, Emily. Oh, it's so great. No, you're, adapting it. you're adapting it for your context, which is actually my favorite when people do that. It's great. Cool. So maybe could you just give us, a, for those of us who haven't um, read the book or followed you, can you just give us a little bit of a background about, um, you know, the, the book is mainly about St. Lydia's and kind of how that came to be and how you came to wrote, write the book? Sure. So, um, yeah, the book follows... It's a memoir, so it follows the trajectory of my life for about a decade when I just moved to New York as a young, recent um, Divinity School graduate, and I was working in a big, fancy church, And um, but while I was there, kept meeting all these younger people who were about my age. I was 26 at this time. Um, 
so I kept meeting all these people at parties who would say like, oh, well, what do you do for a living? And I would say, well, I work at a church. And sometimes they'd be like, oh, <laughs> and they'd sort of back away. <laughs> and other times they'd be like, oh, well, that's interesting. And they kind of want to know more. And I ended up in these spiritual conversations with um, lots of young people, many of whom were looking for a spiritual community, but had not found one. Um, and the context in New York is very much there's a lot of sort of large formal congregations that are progressive, like big steeple churches. And then there's um, a lot of more sort of evangelical congregations that might be more theologically conservative um, and more informal, but not progressive theologically. So I found a lot of people who were sort of liberal minded, LGBTQ affirming, um, justice minded, who weren't really finding a place for um, their spiritual lives. And um, that sort of formed the question that became this dinner church of St. Lydia's um, because I started thinking, well, what would a church for these people look like? And I imagined that it would be very intimate, that it would be a place where you could get to know one another in a deep way because New York is so huge and so anonymous, people really feel lost. And um, the idea of it taking place over a shared meal was very appealing to me because that's an ancient Christian practice, the way that communion actually began in our church. Um, but also in New York City, we have very few opportunities to sit around the table and eat because um, our apartments are like this big and most often you meet people out for a meal. So the idea of cooking together and being together around a table was a very potent um, idea for younger New Yorkers, many of whom were separated from family. Um, so that's kind of how the church came into being and the book follows my trajectory as a young single person who's becoming a, a pastor and some fear and anxiety around that and um, someone who's kind of being drawn into the call of becoming a church planter when that was never my intention and also it follows the trajectory of this congregation as we form and come together and discover identity around the table then being drawn into um, justice work and into the work of getting to know our neighbors and um, working alongside them for justice around affordable housing, police brutality, and kind of learning the stories of our neighbors. So it's a book where a congregation and a pastor kind of deepens their relationships um, around them. Yeah. And, and um, so you were at St. Lydia officially, like you, you had a dream for St. Lydia's that was prior to it creating, but like 2008 to 2017. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. so, and it went, uh, it, it, un it underwent a lot of changes. You were in different locations. It evolved a lot. I think what you see now, if you go is kind of like this kind of, well, maybe we're not all fully realized, but this kind of realized kind of project and community, but it wasn't always like that, right? <laughs> it was not. <laughs> we started out in, um, in the living room of a priest, an Episcopal priest, who kind of said that he would, he was excited about the idea and wanted to steward it along, so he hosted it in his home. And he was, you know, the only person I knew who had a dining room table that could hold 12 people. So <laughs> it was a great place to start. And he's an amazing liturgist, so he helped us get started. And then from there, we moved to a really lovely Lutheran church that um, kind of like became like our mother hen church, like they helped us grow up. <clears throat> we moved to another church that it turned out was like falling down and so four weeks later we moved out of that church and then we were in a zen center for two years while we continued to grow and then finally moved to our own like little storefront space in new york city um where the congregation still gathers except that it's covid right now so they're not there at the moment but um there are many different iterations um on the way to kind of becoming this more fully formed community and it's much like watching a child grow up in a lot of ways. Like there's different developmental stages of a new congregation. And um, yeah, maturity kind of increases as you go and sense of self increases. So it's an amazing process to watch. I mean, I have a few friends um, that are church planters and it's like, it's incredible. The, um, the heart and soul and effort and pain and heartbreak and everything else that goes into it. And I think, and I've, I've served too long established churches. Yeah. Oh my gosh, how did they do this? It's such <laughs> incredible respect. It's a roller coaster. There's some high highs and some low lows. <laughs> and the lows are very low. <laughs> yeah. But every church started that way. And I, I think um, every church wasn't started in this context of kind of like a post-Christendom, post-modern context. 
Um, but every church at some point was a new church kind of finding their way. And that's comforting to think about um, and kind of inspiring, actually, that church planters have been around forever. <laughs> Beginning. <laughs> way back to Paul, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, what do you make of all of us, um, you know, borrowing this dinner church idea? You, you really, you know, dinner church now is something that generally people, if you mention it, people might have some kind of recognition about in, in the church, certainly like among clergy and um, ministry leaders. But um, as you were doing that, that was something that was not on anybody's radar. Mm -hmm. So um, what can you kind of speak to, like, I know for me, how inspiring it's been for me and that we've tried it on in the mm -hmm. churches I've served, but what has that been like to have kind of created this community around a specific need that you saw in New York that then seemed to ripple out to meet needs much uh, much broader yeah well i think the first thing to say is that i stand on the shoulders of um, others who are experimenting with the form not to mention the early church <laughs> so the idea is certainly not um, novel <laughs> in any way um, so you know in the first three centuries of the church the eucharist was a shared meal um, so the idea of being around a table or around gathering around food and having that be our um, our celebration of the Eucharist and the bread and the cup being shared as Christ's uh, body and blood. Um, that idea is very deeply rooted in Christianity and, um, you know, communion kind of evolved into a more symbolic meal, we might say, with, um, you know, a little bit of wine and a little bit of bread. But I had many experiences um, as a student and an intern learning from liturgists who had um, experimented with this idea in different settings. Um, so, for instance, at Yale Divinity School, where I was trained at our ecumenical chapel service, we had something that was called the Hearty Eucharist, which was like a, it was so great. It was like a Eucharistic service, but there was a big table that was filled with like Mediterranean food, like grapes and, you know, olive leaves, stuffed olive, or stuffed grape leaves, stuff like that. Um, so we had been working with that form, and then Union Theological Seminary um, also has a service called At Table, which is kind of similar to what we had been doing. Um, I also was an intern at St. Gregory of Nyssa, and they had a service for many years that was called the Feast of Friends, and it was an additional service. I think it was midweek, um, and I looked at their liturgy and learned a lot from what they had been doing and also trained at St. Gregory of Nyssa, so so much of St. Lydia's informed St. Gregory's. Um, so I've been really delighted to see folks come to St. Lydia's and learn from St. Lydia's and bring it back to their contexts. I think the piece that I've been sort of cautious about is to remind people that um, dinner church is not a model that you can kind of just import into your church <clears throat> and like expect it to change everything. I think what's important about what happened at St. Lydia's was that I was tuned into the culture around me and the spiritual hungers that were present in that culture and saying, you know, New York is a very particular place with particular spiritual hungers. And I think one of the things that would really feed those spiritual hungers is an intimate worship service um, gathering around a meal. So I've tried to kind of encourage people to look at their own communities and to develop liturgies that, that grow out of those communities and the spiritual hungers that exist in your communities. Because, um, you know, for instance, in Baltimore, when I moved here, there's still a very strong tradition in Baltimore of people having Sunday dinner after church. Um, you know, after church every Sunday, they go to their family and the whole family gathers up and they have Sunday dinner. And so dinner church probably wouldn't land the same way in Baltimore <laughs> as it did in New York, where there was such a hunger to be together in a way that felt, that felt like family and that felt connected. So yeah, it's been amazing. I love especially the adaptations of like, the ways that it's been made new and different from what we've been up to in different contexts. Like that I think is fabulous and great. <laughs> and uh, Baltimore, the uh, Eucharist is steamed crabs. As exactly. I'm, I'm sure you've learned by now. You, the Eucharist the is- tables, All the hammers, exactly. Yeah, I, I grew up out, just outside of Baltimore and uh, the, the Holy Meal was a table filled with uh, newsprint, yep. <laughs> with plastic chairs. Yep. Bibs and uh, hammers. <laughs> yeah, and it is a vision of abundance, you know, that, that's, a, that's an absolute holy meal here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they slide all the crabs off the plastic tray onto the table. <laughs> <That's> so great. 
Um, Pete uh, had a question about, um, he was asking about progressive dinners, which is not exactly the, the same. We're kind of talking about the sacrament, but speaking of holy meals, churches, you know, we do a lot of potlucks, we do a lot of things where food are involved um, as well. And are, are some Sunday dinners cultural, Italian, yeah, different, different cultures might kind of have a stronger sense of that Sunday dinner. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Yeah. Well, the progressive dinner is an interesting idea because one of the things I think we've seen during COVID is that there's been a real intimacy to being able to see into people's homes. Like in our congregation, everyone's been meeting each other's pets. My, my cat's around here somewhere, but like holding up our pets and like sometimes giving little tours of our houses or the kids have like showed us their little playrooms and stuff like that. And um, what comes to mind when you say progressive dinners is Las Posadas, where, um, you know, to celebrate uh, Advent and the Holy Family, the church actually like processes around and like knocks on each door and there's like a meal in each place. So I think there's a lot of ways that um, eating and the connection to home can be, and, the, and you know, the stories of the Bible can be sort of woven together in new ways. So a progressive dinner would be very cool, actually. <laughs> Um, it reminded me of, that reminded me of a quote, so I was going through my highlights uh, in my book, and um, just wanted to share a quote with folks, and because um, it, it seemed to me to like capture some of this quarantine churching that we've been doing. Um, so you, you, you wrote um, about, the, it was about the early Christians. So you said that they could hunker down, find the first century version of a bunker, and hide their families deep underground. Instead, they did something different. As the world was rent apart, they came together around a table to share a meal. And at the center of the community, they placed the story of life and death. Um, and I thought, and I wrote next to my, my note, my margin note was COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Hunkering. <laughs> Hunkering down. Oh, do yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is an interesting time. I think, um, it's a funny time to have a book come out that's all about community and communal experience around the table when we can't be around the table. Mm -hmm. And I've actually been hoping that maybe part of what the book can offer is the experience, like when you, re reading is magic, right? So <laughs> when you read, you actually move through time and space to have an experience um, with someone you've often never met. So I think in reading, we can actually be at the table in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that it offers some of that kind of solace. Um, but COVID is such an interesting moment, I think, because we, we're, we're far apart from one another. We're disoriented and um, in some cases fearful, you know, really kind of fearing what's going to happen to my job, what's going to happen to, there's so many questions of, of what if. And I think that that experience is actually very similar to what the early Christians and the followers of Jesus would have experienced in the wake of his resurrection, that resurrection really scatters people. And the effect of it was to send everyone out to kind of their own corners, you know, like the fishermen went back to fishing, like the, the men on the road to Emmaus, like were out on the road, like going to some totally different town. The women were like disbelieved. There's this really kind of fragmenting, fractured experience of the resurrection. And then from that sense of fragmentation, comes this you know new vision of building building a new community um in the wake of kind of understanding what jesus resurrection means um and and of the holy spirit moving at pentecost so i've been trying to think of this time as a kind of and i've been trying to actually do a little bit of writing on this but but there is a sense of us being scattered <clears throat> and i think in the in the context of that scattering we can <clears throat> excuse me um see a new vision for the church in some ways, like the church sent out and scattered is a quite missional understanding of what the church can be. Um, and a lot of my attention recently has been going to um, creating a, a feeding program that involves buying food from a black owned farm and bringing that food to our neighbors in Baltimore. And it's been interesting to see how the church can show up as the church in our neighborhood um, when kind of sent out from our tables, and in this case, sort of forcibly, like we're not allowed to be around our tables. But, you know, what energy and what reimagination could this time bring, um, in as much as it's bringing difficulty and consternation and confusion? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we tend to think of, uh, like, all these disciples and everybody had it all together, 
you know, just despite the, despite the fact that it's some of the gospel writers are very clear that the disciples did not really get it, but um, that Pentecost was this holy chaos and there's a lot of, and the resurrection, you know, when we were doing Easter season this year, we are doing Easter season in the midst, in Easter, in the midst of this quarantine. Mm -hmm. And you look at those stories and say, like, they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what to do, where to go. Mm -mm, not at all. And, and we have the benefit of reading the story in retrospect. Um, so we get this kind of hindsight vision of how it all happens. And it seemed, um, it seemed like it was supposed to end up that way. I mean, similar to how we look back on movements for freedom and think like, oh, you know, everything was just churning along and like now we have these new <laughs> you know like a new way of seeing the world but at the time there's infighting and confusion and uncertainty every decision is um no one knows how it's going to turn out so i think we have good company in that place of um uncertainty and it's a holy place it really is it's a place where uh, a more possibility maybe because things aren't so yeah set We've been disrupted from our, from our routines. So yeah. There's a possibility in that, yeah. Um, so one of the things I loved about the book, and everybody feel free to, um, I could ask Emily questions like for days. So you have just, if you have a question, please ask it. But in the, as long, if you're not, then I will. Um, so what, one of the things I loved about your book um, was the way that you connect, this is kind of along the lines of what we were just talking about, the ways that you connect worship and communion specifically with the work of advocacy and social justice. Um, in the dinner church part, I was more, I would say more familiar with, like I've seen kind of your Facebook posts and, and writings along the way. But I just thought, you know, you, usually when we think about those two things, um, our kind of worship and then kind of our service, advocacy, social justice, we kind of can often think of them as two different things or two separate things or and um, and what I kind of, you know, kind of got from your book was that this kind of evolution that happened with St. Lydia's and you, that it was really rooted in the table, but then that kind of pushed you out into the, these other ways of, yeah. so can you, can you talk about the connection between like table or worship and what we do in the world? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And it's one I'm really interested in. Um, you know, I think in a sort of, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and both in the Episcopal world and in the Lutheran world, there's this notion that <clears throat> we kind of come, sometimes it gets talked about different ways, but there can be this notion that we come to the table to kind of be filled in some way, and then we're kind of sent out into the world. <clears throat> Excuse me, having such trouble with my voice this morning, but um, then we're kind of sent out into the world to kind of do God's work. And I think that's a beautiful image, and it's also one that um, has kind of like sometimes I have a little trouble with it because it kind of has an us versus them quality. We're sort of like, we're the church and then we go to kind of serve the world that's kind of out there, like outside our walls. And um, in some cases, it also seems to me that our worship fills us up, but then we sort of never do anything, <laughs> to be totally honest. Like there's plenty of communities that I've been part of where like that second part just doesn't happen. <laughs> so I think with St. Lydia's, I was curious in seeing what would happen if <clears throat> worship and service were taking place simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> and there was less of a division between kind of what happens in church and what's going on in the world, but instead what was happening at the table was itself justice work. Um, so there were lots of different kinds of people who were at St. Lydia's um, through the years. And I would say that some of them were people who um, we're often on the receiving end of service, like we're on the receiving end of a soup kitchen line or the receiving end of a shelter. And it meant so much for them to come to St. Lydia's and to get to help set up the tables and to help cook the meal and then put out, you know, put out the tablecloths and sit down and share a meal with us communally and collectively, rather than being this kind of passive recipient of, um, of like good works, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So that was one piece of it, that rather than kind of us serving them, we were all serving one another as a community. Um, and the second piece was that um, over the years, I think that we learned um, a set of spiritual practices because of the way that we worship together that prepared us to be neighbors in a different way. So for instance, you know, every Sunday we came together and we sat around these tables 
And it was not always comfortable. It was not always easy. Like often it was really awkward, you know, sitting next to a stranger and making table conversation can be sort of like bumpy and weird. Um, but we learned over the years, like how to tolerate discomfort. We learned how to sit in ambiguity um, and kind of, we also learned how to be in relationship and in communion with people who were very different from us and to kind of have that feeling of like, I don't know what to say to this person. Like they seem so different to me from me. I don't even know where to start. Um, so we kind of built our capacity in all these different ways. And I think that when we then moved into the work of being in relationship with our neighbors, we had a set of skills that allowed us to, um, to tolerate a lot of discomfort and unclarity and ambiguity and uncertainty about how that would go. Um, and that's, I think a really important spiritual practice, especially for white folks and especially for people of a certain level of privilege, we're often not used to navigating a world that's uncomfortable for us. So building our tolerance for discomfort um, is one of the tools we need if we're going to engage in any kind of racial justice work or really any kind of justice work at all, because we're going to be moving into spaces where we don't feel as comfortable and we need to have the skills to just say, um, I'm going to sit with this um, and I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to run out the door. I'm not going to like assert myself as a leader who needs to be in control. I'm just going to kind of be here. Um, yeah. So that's a, some of that connecting pieces. Hmm. I thought, um, one of the, my favorite parts of the book was you're talking about your kind of vulnerability in that. Like we have a heart, you know, we're, we're experiencing this as a community. We have neighbors that we want to know and respond to and, and understand and help. But like kind of there were like the kind of stops and starts that are involved in that. Like I want to help. I'm not sure I'm doing it the right way. How does this happen? And, um, and you share some great, and I'm not gonna give spoilers, but like there's <laughs> great ways that did, that did happen. But yeah. I think uh, probably um, there are a good number of us at the moment who are kind of in a place of, I wanna do something, I wanna help, mm -hmm. I wanna understand, but, and I, speak for my, I can speak for myself, like I'm not quite sure how to do that. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not quite sure where to begin. Like, and, um, and I'm listening to a lot of colleagues um, online about some ways to go about doing that, but as you described your experience, I thought, boy, I think a lot of people are probably feeling that way at the moment. Yeah, and that was really my, my primary motivation in writing the book is that I hoped it could be a com companion to people. To It's not a how-to of like how to start a church or how to start a dinner church or how to do racial justice, but it is a story of my own experience in walking through a process of creation and a process of awakening to the injustice of the world. And I think that, um, it helps to see how other people have walked that road ahead of you. And for white folks, I think it helps to see that process in detail, actually. Um, you know, part of the, the story, you know, for me, my own, I had several awakenings along the way, but the biggest one that took place was around um, Hurricane Sandy. And the hurricane in New York City, like really just laid bare the extent of economic injustice and I saw it, you know, across the street from me. My neighbors in the public housing unit had a very different experience of that hurricane than I did. And um, it really opened my eyes in a way that was very painful and that brought up a lot of shame and that I wanted to, at times I wanted to distance myself from it. But that tolerance for discomfort and ambiguity allowed me to kind of continue to engage as opposed to like receding. Um, and in the book, you'll see that there were many, many years where I sort of tried to build relationship in the neighborhood and it took St. Lydia's a long time to find our place. You know, it doesn't happen. It's not like a customer service relationship. <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. You know, relationship building takes a long time and there's fits and starts and things that work and things that don't work. And some organizations are a great fit and others like it just doesn't work out. So I hope that the book gives people a sense of um, sort of resilience and um, courage in kind of continuing down, even when things aren't going how you expected that they might. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so hopefully it's a good companion, but it takes time and it takes patience with ourselves. And I think it also takes a sense of um, just like, getting back up every day and like doing it again, you know, just doing your own piece over and over and over again. Um, a sense of like, 
unrelenting dedication. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, Sarah echoes that. She, uh, Sarah in the in the chats and tolerating discomfort is a really important point um, right now and needing to have conversations that need need to happen. So yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And George had George had a question in the Q and A, um, which he said silly question, which is not a silly question. It is one of the questions. Uh, how do you gain a better understanding of your community and the spiritual hunger of your community? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I think that's mm -hmm. huge. Well, I think for me, I was unknowingly going about a listening process in my community. Um, and I did that mostly by going to bars and meeting people, which is a great way to do it. <laughs> it's research. I call it research. <laughs> I was just out in the community, like, meeting people. Um, because I didn't have very many friends, you know, I was new in New York and I needed to make friends. And as I did that, I discovered that there was this deep spiritual hunger. But as St. Lydia has developed, that process of listening became more intentional. So when when we as a congregation moved to our permanent location in Gowanus, um, <clears throat> actually before we moved, we set about having an intentional time of listening every year. Um, and the first year I trained the congregation on how to do a one on one which is a very simple community organizing tool where you meet with someone in order to understand their life better and in order to understand the, um, the strengths and the difficulties that they're facing in their neighborhood and in their context. And so we all learned how to do a one-on-one. -on -one. And that first year we just practiced by doing three one-on-ones with like anyone we wanted to. So some people asked the person that worked at the corner bodega if they would do a one-to-one -one with them. And some people asked um, someone that they'd always been curious about at work. So we just kind of practiced that first year. And then um, each year after, every spring, we would have a season of listening. And that was always a time to connect more deeply with our neighborhood. <clears throat> so, and it was different each year. There was one year where we like literally stood outside the church and talked to anyone who went by, which was like very uncomfortable for my congregants. And we only did that once, <laughs> but I learned a ton. I learned so much. And there were actually a lot of neighbors who were very happy to speak with us. And the second year um, we invited neighbors to come and preach at St. Lydia's and to hear about their experiences of the neighborhood. Um, I also, I was lucky enough that our neighborhood had a book that someone had written about it, which was great. So it's a wonderful book. Um, so I read all about Gowanus and the history and I preached about that. So just like every, you know, every week, every year, kind of deepening our relationship to the neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood, it does not happen overnight. It's a, um, it's a spiritual process and practice that you're engaging in as a Christian is how I would describe it. And that doesn't, doesn't end, you know? So that's what we did. But I think looking to community organizing for tools around listening is a really fabulous place to start. And sometimes your neighborhood is not, you know, the houses around your church. Sometimes your neighborhood is like, you know, maybe your church tends to attract people who are retired. So then it might be all the retired folks in your community. Or maybe it's like a, neighbor that, a neighborhood that's down the way that like is in a different socioeconomic uh, context than you are that you want to get to know. So the, the idea of neighborhood is pretty, pretty broad, actually. It's a um, tricky thing. So um, here at Upper Dublin, mm -hmm. a couple years ago, we got a grant uh, through Princeton Seminary for the Zoe project, which is kind of what, what are the asking, like, what are the spiritual needs of young adults mm -hmm. in our community? And how do we do something around that? And uh, we, we've been on a we've been on a big sabbatical though. We still, we still have the funding and we still have the support, but, um, that happens uh, by event. Yeah. <laughs> we're still asking the question. Um, but it was that sense of like, uh, it was very instructive, like, okay, go out to the community, ask young adults, ask people who are in, you know, in community. So we were kind of talking to people in Ambler. We talked to the mayor and talked to like other people about who they, you know, what they thought the, the needs would be. And so, we had a project that we were going in the church we were working with closed. So we kind of got uh, put on pause, but, um, but I would say oh, there were 12 churches that were working in that project that the common theme was loneliness. Mm. And then the question was how, I mean, by and large, like there was this need for longing for community, like you talk about in your book and the sense of profound loneliness. Mm -hmm. And then like you know, for each, for each, um, 
church or each project was like, well, how do you meet that need in this place mm-hmm. with, with the community you have, the neighbors you have, the resources that you have? Um, yeah. But it was, you know, it, it's like, that's when George asked that question. I was like, I know that's like a key question because it's, it takes a lot of time and it's hard. It's actually, if it's not your thing, yeah. it's, you know, that it can be really hard to, to get at and then build something around. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy. And actually the first year that we did listening, I thought that we could just do listening all year long, like that it would be something that we did all the time. And people were totally exhausted and kind of freaked out actually. Like it was, um, we were a pretty introverted congregation. So it's actually very extroverted work to be, I think when you take the energy to connect with someone new or like push out into a place that's outside of your kind of the world that you operate in, that takes energy. So I had to learn that like, we had to be, um, we had to be aware of how much energy that was taking for the congregation and not like burn out on it. And I needed to not burn out on it. And so that's when we moved to doing it every spring. Um, and springtime is a time when people are kind of coming out of their winter cocoons and like, it feels like an extroverted time anyway. So we kind of lined it up with the energy level of the congregation. Um, our year had a sort of, um, we, we did a season of listening in the, spring in the summer we did a kind of like a focus on identity um our congregational identity and we had a retreat in the fall we did a justice season always because the fall feels like this time of like you know starting in new on on new things and kind of reinvigorated and then we actually kind of went into more of like a hibernation time in winter um because in new york you're outside on the subways and like everybody just wants to like curl up in winter so things got more small it's kind of kind of like in some congregations they go away for the summer and things get slower but for us it was the winter where things got slower so i think understanding that sense of your own rhythm and then also i think call is so important that you know for me like neighborhood connection and racial justice work is deep in my bones because i grew up in a context where um i grew up in a very multicultural uh town in a public school where racial uh difference was um, extremely, like was right on the surface. Like I could see that my experience as a white person was very different from the experience of my African-American peers in school. Um, And I grew up with all these questions about that, like why that was. And um, the book talks a little bit about those experiences, but so this desire to know neighbors and to reach across boundaries and to connect with people and to um, seek justice in the world is like buried deep in me. And I think we all have um, a different sense of call about the work that we're called to. So yeah, it's, if you, if you, if you sink the work in call, there's a a greater sense of energy, I think related to it. You know, you can keep coming back to it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah asked a question in the chat, um, talking, she's talking to her kids about racial justice. They're nine and 11. Um, uh, Mm -hmm. And want my children to move further to be able to see the inequality and ask themselves why, and then move into the community to become change makers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the book about that? Um, Let's say like the book is about that in a sense. (laughs) Yeah, I think nine and 11, that's great. And I think it's really important to have these conversations with kids, like absolutely important. Um, because that's when we like soak up all these messages about who is of value and who is not. Um, One of the stories that I tell in the book is of sitting in my third grade classroom when I was a little girl and my dad came to visit the classroom one day and he noticed something that I was not aware of as a kid, which is that my teacher only called on the the children who, um, who, who had their hands up who were white and all the black kids had their hands up and she just never called on them. Um, instead she would tell them to sit still or to stop fidgeting. Um, and this is like the basis of the, um, the school to prison pipeline in our nation that black children are treated differently from a very early age in school. And then they get more detentions, they're expelled more often, they're punished more severely. And that experience, you know, doesn't make you want to invest in your education or (laughs) it really changes your relationship to your school and your teachers. Um, so you know, if, if I remember my parents talking to me about that and actually the result 
which was very complicated, was that I changed schools in the end. Um, so that's a whole other story. But I remember my dad coming. I remember him talking to me about it. I remember being aware of it. Um, so having those conversations like certainly changed the way that I viewed the world from a very young age. And I saw the ways in which my experiences were very different from those of many of the students around me. And I saw the inequity in that. Um, so I think it's wonderful that you want to talk to your kids. And there are a lot of really great books. Um, if you do like a quick Google search on like racial justice books for children, there's a ton that's going to come up. I would definitely look for ones that are written by African American authors. Um, and I think those books can be a great starting place to just read them together and then have a conversation um, with your kids. And certainly like, you know, one of the things that happened in our congregation was um, Part of the book revolves around the story of a young child, Nicholas Naquan Hayward Jr., who was killed by a police officer across the street from me in 1994, um, long before I ever lived there. But his father was still in the neighborhood and working for justice for his son. Um, and learning the story of Nicholas really changed my relationship to the neighborhood. And um, I shared that story with my congregation, and that changed their relationship to the neighborhood. Um, a piece of that was starting to show up in the neighborhood when there were every year there was a remembrance day and um, a, a remembrance day and a vigil for Nicholas and so the congregants from St. Lydia's would come from that to that hear the stories and they would bring their children and so we had a number of kids who were there learning that story um, learning the name of Nicholas McQuan and learning that their experience as white children was very different from what he experienced. Um, and so that was a really important thing. So I think taking your kids to stuff and using that as a conversation point is important. And, um, you know, there are some things to consider around um, developmental and age appropriateness in these conversations. Um, but for the most part, I think once they reach like eight, nine, 10, to come to some of these events and to have conversations, as long as there's conversation afterward, it's it's a part of the world that we live in, and it's important that they um, engage that, that, those realities in a developmentally, developmentally appropriate way. I think sometimes we think about talking with our kids about race. Um, this is sort of like, now I'm bringing this conversation to, to you. Yeah. And my kids are already like, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> what you're saying, like, <laughs> my kids will definitely say, uh, yeah. But um, I like, <laughs> but like you're... I'm bringing this conversation to you. <laughs> Right, exactly. It's actually the case. I mean, maybe listening to our kids around this, like they, kids are so tuned in. They see hypocrisy like this. They're very tuned into what's unfair in the world. They have excellent questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've watched our activists from Parkville, like our activists who are working with um, uh, uh, environmental justice, like our kids are on point. So right, right. <laughs> they could probably offer some resources to us. Yeah. So we we're kind of like getting our courage up to like, now we're going to talk about this. Like, you know, like you were saying your experience in school, like I'm already thinking about this. Like yeah. I want to, I need conversation about it. I need some, you know, understanding about it, but like, it's already there. It's not like we're cracking open something that hasn't already kind yeah. of occurred to some our kids in some some way shape or form they're already seeing it yeah and the absence of conversation around it only creates a sort of silence yeah where and when there's void and silence people put their own stuff into it you know <laughs> um so Dottie uh had this question in the q a about um you know how did you deal with folks in your congregation who were negative about this approach and i might kind of just ask it mm -hmm. this way which is um you're really asking you're really asking your people or the or the congregation was like just um, things that people might not feel comfortable with mm -hmm. that might you know might disagree with but I mean just as you're describing like yeah you know, we're gonna show up and talk to a bunch of strangers or we're gonna sit at a meal for like an hour with people we don't know and as an <laughs> introvert that makes me like my heart starts to race <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's not, uh, so how, and, and you're creating this, uh, community kind of from scratch, you know? Um, so was it kind of like, this is who we are, or this is who we're evolving to be together, or some people I'm, I can be comfortable with this, but I'm not so comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Like how, how do you hold that all together? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the questions folks asked me when St. Lydia's was just getting going was, well, what about the introverts? Like what, 
what about them? Like, this doesn't sound very comfortable for them, like you're saying. <laughs> and actually the whole church was filled with introverts and I'm an introvert. And I think that um, what, what's interesting about discomfort is that often alongside it, and this is something that my mentor Donald Shell taught me, is a great desire. Like we, what he said is we desire what we also fear. And so, you know, I desire intimacy. I'm also afraid of intimacy. <laughs> I desire connection in my neighborhood. And I'm also like very, you know, worried about that or feel impeded from it. Um, and I desire justice also and have a lot of fear about what that would mean and how to pursue it. Um, so I think like holding that sort of balance that actually this isn't, we're not approaching a conversation where we have to kind of push justice on people um, when they don't want to hear it. Like actually what we're doing is opening people's hearts to their deepest desire. Um, and I would say that the people who are attracted to St. Lydia's already came with a desire to be involved in justice work. Um, they came with a deep desire to see um, equity in the world and to see justice done. And they came with a very deep desire to follow their call and to um, to be to live as faithful people in the world in a way that they could make sense of as like young New Yorkers who were not living particularly like traditional Christian lives, if that makes sense. But I think that rooting the conversation, particularly around, around justice, in stories and in desire and in um, kind of like. Our, our very best selves, like the, what the best part of us wants is, is a really important tool when we talk about preaching for justice. And um, sometimes justice-based preaching and conversation can become very shouty. Like people feel, um, yeah, just shouted at and like they're not good enough. <laughs> and um, I don't think that that's a great place to, to start when it comes to making change. I think it actually is about people connecting to their deep desires and their deep experiences. Um, a huge part of me growing as someone who is seeking justice in the world was understanding my own stories around race and um, like remembering what it was like as a third grader, um, remembering the messages that I heard growing up and remembering my own sense of like, well, this doesn't make sense. So I think if we actually do that like deep heart work first um, and connect with our own sense of call and our own sense of um, yeah, our own sense of desire. I'll say that. That kind of like opens us up to a different kind of conversation. And also relationship has the power to kind of blow open those places of fear as well. So, you know, hearing statistics about police brutality can feel overwhelming and sometimes like something we might want to push away. But when I heard a father in my neighborhood tell the story of what happened to his son, um, I was incensed and outraged as I should be um, because that child was 14 years old. Um, no, I'm sorry, I believe he was 11 actually. He's a he was a child. So um, I think particular stories have the capacity to, to change us in a different way and to motivate us in a different way. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then we connect those stories to the larger statistics and start to see like, oh, this is not just something that happened in one neighborhood. It's something that happens in many neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, before, uh, we're gonna, we'll wrap up uh, here at the top of the hour, but before you go, it's Pride Month. Yes. And um, so I wanted to make sure to ask you um, about, could you tell us about what you're doing at Dreams and Visions? And yeah. uh, so that's not in the book, maybe it's in the next book, <laughs> uh, but I uh, would love to hear. Yeah, well, we, I mean, I, it's been a little disappointing for Pride because usually for Pride, you know, our congregation is an LGBTQ rooted congregation. I myself am queer and gender queer. And um, usually we would go to the Pride Festival and have a booth where we have this like very cool halo mosaic and people stand in front of it and have their, have their picture taken so that they, you know, are reminded that they're a saint and that they're made in God's image. Um, so we couldn't do that this year because Baltimore Pride is canceled. Um, and instead, we've been having online worship services. And actually, what we've done this year for Pride is I'm, I'm creating a justice series that's going to bring us all through the summer. And we're looking at the passage from Luke 4, where Jesus is speaking in the temple when he's in his hometown. And he quotes from Isaiah and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Um, 
for God has anointed me to bring good news to the captives, to release the captives, to bring good news to the poor, um, to let the oppressed go free. And we're going to take each week to look at one of those phrases. So next week we're looking at um, to bring release to the captives and we're going to talk about mass incarceration and imprisonment um, in our nation. And during Pride, we looked at the first two lines, which are the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this week we're looking at because God has anointed me. And so, and, and, and asking, you know, what does it mean that God's anointed us to do the work that we're called to do? Um, so many folks in the LGBTQ community have been told that they are excluded from God's promise. They're excluded from God's love. They should be excluded from their families. And so to, um, to, to actually rem remind ourselves that God has anointed me um, is a very powerful thing for folks in our congregation. So that's what we're doing for Pride. And maybe a little surprise if I can pull it together. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I can. So <laughs> it's been a pretty tough run with COVID. So we'll see how it goes. But we were thinking one congregant had a great idea to do like a blessing booth that would be like socially distanced <laughs> where you could like come by and like, I don't know, we'd like throw confetti on you from a distance or something, but we might get that worked, worked out for the last week of June. We'll see. <laughs> if I have people to help me, we'll do it. <laughs> and you do an incredible Christmas pageant, like a beautiful, beautiful, incredible Christmas. Great Christmas pageant. Yeah, and that was around the same thing, a pastoral. This goes back to listening to your community. You know, I was hearing so many folks who are part of the LGBTQ community around Christmas saying like, Christmas is devastating. I don't have a relationship with my biological family. I can't go to church um, because I've been kicked out and I don't trust my faith, any faith community. And so I kind of said like, well, can we create a Christmas, a queer Christmas that's for um, just for people who feel like they don't have a spot. And so we do a huge pageant where everyone gets a costume and um, the whole story is acted out. And um, there's a lot of like beautiful pageantry and spectacle. And um, we are like 100% ourselves and it's really wonderful. But the whole message of the pageant is, um, is that the story is for you. Like you're, you are part of the story. You are part of God's incarnation um, and that cannot be taken away. So <laughs> there are pictures on Facebook if you wanna check it out, they're pretty fun. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I know we have to uh, wrap up at 12. Thank you for answering all my questions. <laughs> And thanks for your wonderful questions and comments. I'm, I'm reading all of them through. We didn't yeah, specifically respond great. to each one, but I'm, I'm reading them and taking them in. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Great questions, everybody. Thanks thank you. This is our, yeah, this is our second time doing this. So Jim Keat was here uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we had him do, um, he talked about living in an Airstream for the last year with he, he and the yeah, his wife and um, wild. It's a good time to live in an airstream, I gotta say. <laughs> he said sales are way up. <laughs> you pick this moment. <laughs> so we're, it's like this real opportunity of being able to online, yeah, you know, connect with friends who we've tracked with for years and actually be able to introduce them to. Oh, it's great. You know, yeah, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I wonder if I could close. I'm going to read a little a, a, another quote from the book. If it's not too awkward for me reading quotes back to you. That one's great. <laughs> <laughs> this <is good. laughs> um, so this is um, about abundance and scarcity. Um, so page 109. So, St. Lydia showed me abundance is a secret hidden inside of scarcity. It lives tucked inside not enoughness, waiting to show you that God does not do math. Abundance is discovering God's provision right in the middle of your feet and work, fret and worry. Even when the bank balance has plummeted and the cupboard seems empty, there's always enough to feed everyone. There are some dry beans and a few carrots in the back of the fridge, and we always have bread in the freezer. We can feast on that. So, Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Keith. It's been um, just wonderful to be here with you. So, and yeah. wonderful to be with all of your congregants. Thanks for being here and for your engagement. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Emily, thank you so much. This is awesome. And I just so appreciate you and your, your ministry and your story. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be with you. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody.